Hello and welcome to History 342. Today I want to talk about war crimes, or to be more specific, the Tokyo Trials and the attempt to bring justice, I suppose for lack of a better word, to the perpetrators of various Japanese war crimes, including ones we talked about before, such as the rape of Nanjing and the comfort women system. This is a very problematic issue and depending on your point of view, either got derailed or corrupted or was just hopelessly muddled and confused the whole way through. Theoretically, the Tokyo trials were parallel to the Nuremberg trials over in Germany and that you would see a similar kind of punishment of Japanese militarists as you saw of the Nazis. The result ends up being a bit more complicated than that and there's kind of, there's, there's kind of two broad reasons. One um, is the emperor and particularly perceptions of the emperor and the other is the uh, the soon to come role or certainly as as the trials are going on the emerging role for japan in what is going to be soon known as american cold war policy so let's talk about the emperor for a few minutes um i mentioned this briefly before but um you know so general MacArthur takes over spring commander of the allied powers scap scap and he and his fellow americans kind of very quickly form very kind of certain views of um, the emperor and the role of the emperor in Japanese society. Now we know from our class that for many, many centuries at this point, the emperor is certainly kind of at the heart of um, an ideological explanation for Japanese identity and an ideological, um, you know, definition of Japanese identity. And, you know, there've been ups and downs to this. And so for a very, very long time, in fact, for most of the office's existence, the truth is that the emperor is nothing more than a figurehead. Now, as we know, in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, that didn't substantively change. However, the way the emperor was talked about changed quite significantly, or at the very least, the amount of people, the amount of Japanese people directly involved in talking about the emperor and being encouraged to think about the emperor and being encouraged to kind of place the emperor at the center of a national theory, that became much more prominent. Alongside the introduction of universal education into Japanese society and of course also conscription, where virtually all Japanese male adults at some point have served for three years in the military. So there's kind of this long-standing kind of run um, you know, evolution of the understanding of how the emperor works. And certainly at the height of 1930s um, and very early 1940s, you know, militarist propaganda, this kind of loyalty to the emperor, this way of the subject kind of way of thinking, this, this uh, we're all in this together and we all serve the emperor, it reached kind of a fever pitch, at least with certain sections of society. And censorship was such, um, and militarist control of free speech or the lack of free speech really was such that that was the only real discourse that had any oxygen at all. So into this scenario, you have um, General Douglas MacArthur, who is this very, you know, forthright man, um, very confident um, and very kind of, you know, where I would come from in Ireland, we would say he calls a spade a spade. This kind of, you know, uh, cut and dried, very simple kind of a guy. And a war hero. I mean, Dwight Eisenhower, who will soon be president of the United States of America and was himself a war hero in World War II, had served under MacArthur. Um, in the Philippines. MacArthur was, you know, was a very, very big deal and MacArthur was very comfortable with being um, a big deal. And, and so he kind of comes in and so he, he, he's kind of looking for this straightforward way, I suppose, to kind of solve these Japanese problems. And he early on is interacting with very important elites, uh, Japanese elites, who have various kind of interests in ways of depicting the emperor and thinking about the emperor. And we'll get onto them in just a second. But so, so, so where is, um, you know, where's MacArthur coming from? Well, he basically, you know, he sees Japan as a possible bulwark against communism. The Cold War hasn't started yet, but MacArthur's very, very communist skeptic, as many Americans were. There was this sense that the Soviets were certainly going to try and expand, um, although it doesn't happen until 1949. China is soon to become a communist country. And so there's this, there's this desire to keep Japan strong, keep Japan solid, and kind of not rock the boat, as it were. And in MacArthur's mind, and in the minds of many uh, people surrounding MacArthur, both, both American and Japanese, keeping Hirohito, keeping the emperor in place, would be a really important plank in that particular strategy. The other side of it, which is a little bit, you know, um, less pleasant, is that MacArthur was fairly quick to adopt what we would call a culturally essentialist view um, of the Japanese. And so cultural essentialism is kind of essentially kind of a, a way of thinking that includes stereotyping. The idea that entire cultures, societies, and so on can be reduced to specific characteristics, or at least can be identified 
by certain characteristics. So as I, if we were in class, this stupid joke would land a bit better as the Irish are erudite and charming, for example, or perhaps are feckless drunks, right? You have the, these ideas of entire characteristics assigned to specific groups of people. And so, you know, MacArthur and others, other Americans are coming into Japan, a, a, a Japan devastated by World War II, as we know. Um, and they're, you know, they hear the way people speak and Japanese culture has lots of body language in it that's very important in terms of bowing um, and showing deference physically to people. Um, and there's a lot of deference being shown to the Americans. Um, Japanese cuisine and the American cuisine of that time were very, very different. Um, there were just all these, all these ways in which Japan seemed alien, exotic, exciting. And this is a, this is a very long term, um, you know, uh, concept in Western experiences of Asia. But MacArthur and the Americans around him, you know, the, MacArthur was open to seeing Japan as something different and Japan requiring a different solution to what perhaps might be needed in Germany or somewhere else like that. Um, in particular, there's this sense, the sense develops quite quickly, that Hirohito is not just central, but essential to any kind of a stable Japan politically going forward. There's this concept of kokutai, uh, Kokutai is kind of the national polity, the national kind of identity, national grouping of an idea, which has really only kind of emerged back in the 19th century. And as we saw in the 1870s and 1880s, was something that was really kind of bolstered by Hirohito and, uh, or sorry, not Hirohito, wasn't alive yet, that was bolstered by the Meiji government in support of the emperor. And the emperor was put in the center of this national theory idea. This theory is still kind of knocking around. And although um, there are very different ways of looking at it, um, uh, MacArthur broadly accepts it and adopts it and decides to go with it. Um, and so there's a kind of a transition over to seeing Hirohito as politically vital. Now, MacArthur um, was uh, completely interested and open to the idea that the Japanese people believed that Hirohito was divine. Now, there's They'd certainly been told he was divine, and, and Japanese people had been told the emperor was a divine figure for many, many centuries. Um, and, and it's true that when Hirohito comes on the radio at the end of the war and announces the war is over, it's this amazing kind of moment in Japanese history and it's traumatic for many Japanese. At the same time, um, it's a really challenging idea and you, you, you need to be careful not to just go ahead and assume that the Japanese, that every single Japanese person believed that the emperor was a god. There's not, there's not, that, that's a very challenging thing to kind of, to kind of figure out. And sure enough, on the 1st of January 1946, the emperor formally renounces his divinity um, and, you know, kind of makes it clear that he's not divine. But that, that never really mattered to MacArthur very much. You know, MacArthur relied on an old kind of aide of his, Bonner Fellers, who is most famous, unfortunately, for having various communications of his intercepted by the Nazis in Northern Africa in the early 1940s. Um, at this point, is a close aide to MacArthur, has worked with him for years, um, and is kind of a proponent of what we would now know as like psychological warfare. And Fellers prepares a brief that states very clearly, listen, if we were to allow the emperor to be removed or if we imprisoned him or, you know, if we destroyed the office of the, of the if, if we destroyed the imperial seat, um, Japan would cease to function, that it would be, it would be debilitating to Japanese society, um, specifically Japanese political society. And MacArthur completely goes along with this idea. This idea, it must be said, is being shared largely by lots of local Japanese elites. You have Shigemetsu Mamoru, uh, who was, you know, uh, the foreign secretary at the end of the war, and actually one of the one of the men who signed the Articles of Surrender. Um, it's kind of a classic example, and Dower talks about him in the book uh, with uh, at some length. Uh, uh, Shigemitsu was kind of an interesting figure. He was kind of fairly well known in the West. The uh, Western papers are called him, calling him Shigi for a while. He's kind of this well known kind of. He's kind of the face of Japan, as it were, um, as a foreign minister. But Shigemitsu is very clear um, and 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 is very is central to making a very specific argument, which is that there is a um, a spirit of Japan and that the Japanese are essentially democratic. Now this contradicts everything the government had said with either Hirohito's support or acquiescence or just silence. It's um, This is what makes the emperor a difficult figure historically to kind of analyze. Um, it definitely goes against the language of the militarists in the 1930s, but of course this was a large part of the point. 
What Shigemitsu and others are starting to argue is like, listen, Japan is a democratic place. Japan celebrates ideals that are shared by the United States and by the British and the French and, and yes, by the Germans before the Nazis took over. That Japan is this enlightenment country. Now, there's a lot of interesting things that are going on here going back to at least 1868 and the notion of kind of embracing this evolution of Japan as a success story for a specific package of Western advances, such as the Enlightenment um, and civil rights and rights individual and everything else. And Shigemetsu and others are arguing, listen, um, the problem here is that Japan, Japanese people share these ideals with American people. The Japanese people and American people are no different. And the emperor is at the forefront of this and the emperor supports this. What happened was these generals, these militarists, these gangsters, they got in between the emperor and his people, which is a fantastically clever little piece of semantics because it serves two functions. One, um, this is a long-standing element in Japanese politics and Japanese political culture that if you want to denigrate somebody and really kind of invalidate them and delegitimize them, you can show them as not just kind of being opposed to the emperor, but actively undermining him and actively working against him. And of course, what does the emperor stand for? Pretty vaguely defined ideas about um, things that are good and things that the Japanese people want um, and what is good for Japan. And certainly as soon as the war is over, not being seen as war criminals as a, as a country would be good for Japan. Secondly, this fits extremely well with the existing Allied narrative, um, which has kind of begun in Casablanca and continues on, you know, through uh, the Potsdam declarations that effectively is arguing that there are gangster militarists. There's a minority of, of, uh, uh, of people who effectively took control of Japan against the will of most Japanese and used military force, intimidation and bullying tactics, fascist tactics, to, uh, to stare down the rest of Japan or to, to, to make it, you know, to make it dangerous, physically dangerous, um, to oppose them. And, and so, and that was the wrong. And so the emperor can't be held accountable for that. You know, the emperor suffered just like the people of Japan suffered. This is, um, this is pretty convenient stuff for the emperor, frankly. Um, why are people doing it? Well, you know, there are lots of local Japanese elites like Shigemetsu Mamoru and others who firmly believe, uh, they believe the imperial seat must be protected. Now that doesn't mean that their view of the importance of the imperial seat and MacArthur's view of the importance are the same thing. They're not. It's impossible for MacArthur to have the context that the Japanese political figures have. That's just not possible. There's not, nothing against MacArthur. There's no way he can understand it. Um, at least not having only been in the country a couple of months and not being able to speak a word of the Japanese language. There's just He's not able to do it. So, so he's kind of understanding it in a way that makes sense for him. The Japanese elites are pushing it for reasons of their own. And you're seeing a confluence of coming together of these different groups. So we're left with a bit of a problem though. So if we're not going to blame Hirohito, who are we going to blame? In the end, you have these three classes of uh, war crime, class A, class B, and class C. Class B and class C get kind of muddled together in terms of kind of ordering out the crimes operationally versus carrying them out. Class A are like, you know, the, the architects of war. And it's a fascinating moment because um, we're seeing a point where the, the idea of waging war uh, is effectively becoming criminalized in this post-World War II world. But over in Nuremberg, over in Germany, you had these kind of very fairly prominent Nazis. Hirohito, um, in the end, somewhat awkwardly, just isn't even indicted. It's kind of a, it just doesn't happen. They just kind of sidestep it as much as they can in what today continues to be a fairly controversial step. But you kind of need a bad guy, don't you? If there were architects of this terrible thing, who was doing all that? Well, the answer is Tojo Hideki. Now, Tojo had been the military leader. He had been the leader of the government as well. The two things were kind of fused together. And during World War II, Tojo had been at the center of a lot of American propaganda. Tojo was known to many Americans, or at least his name was known to many, many Americans. And he was kind of seen, you know, he was the guy behind Pearl Harbor and, and he was, um, he, you know, he was the dictator. And so there was an existing amount of work had been done um, in Western propaganda to kind of paint Tojo as this kind of, you know, Mussolini slash Hitler type dictator. Now that is all a little bit 
tricky and there's a lot of moving around that happens. In particular, um, John Dower's book talks about the Conway Memorial from Conway Fumimaro, who we know was Prime Minister back in the 1930s. And Conway writes this memorial. A memorial was an old style uh, way of, of communicating with the emperor. You'd write out what's called a memorial and you'd send it to the emperor. It's called memorializing the emperor. So he writes this memorial to the emperor, basically explaining, um, further developing Shigemetsu's idea of how the emperor was betrayed by specific militarists and effectively pointing the finger at Tojo. Now, this is all very, very messy because Tojo and Konoe were uh, rivals in the 1930s and there's a worrying, there are worrying questions around the extent to which does Tojo end up getting um, fingered in large part because he's just, he loses a political battle. There's more to it than that. I mean, Tojo, Tojo was, uh, Tojo made a lot of decisions that resulted in uh, very terrible things happening. Uh, Tojo does kind of fit this class A crime better than most. But the key here and the complexity here is that he certainly wasn't the only one. Tojo and six others are executed and Tojo becomes the, the, the star of a process, of a trial that takes on very, very high language and the notion, you know, they name, you know, one of the judges, I think it was Keenan, the American judge, names civilization as a plaintiff and the idea that Tojo and his and his collaborators or his fellow conspirators, whatever you want to call them, have effectively been scheming against an entire way of life and this has to be stopped. And so Tojo becomes a centerpiece of this. And in this whole process, Hirohito is nowhere to be found. So the discussion question for this video is another one of these ones that's a little bit kind of seems simple and maybe is a little bit tricky. So is that Hirohito escapes indictment for war crimes and the rationale on the American side and the Japanese side, though they are, they are nuanced in difference in both sides, is that um, maintaining Hirohito's position in Japanese society is vital to rebuilding Japan in the years immediately following World War II. Question is, were they right? I will say, be careful now with this question. If you are talking about um, generalizations, cultural generalizations, cultural assumptions, and everything else, be very clear that you're doing that. Um, uh, you need to be very careful when you're writing not to give the impression that you yourself subscribe to these very kind of culturally essentialist views of people. It's just something to be careful about, and I see it all the time, um, but just kind of a, a note of warning on that particular point. Um, it's not something you're going to get in trouble with for this assignment or anything, but it's, it's an important thing to be, to be practicing. But, you know, so that's it. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.